welcome to the Lime Lou podcast, where we get behind the buzz of sustainability and talk to the people building a greener tomorrow. I'm your host, Antali Manuel. Today, I'm joined with Ali Aladrisi, the founder and CEO of UpChoose. Thank you for, so much for joining me today. Hi, hi, Antali. Really glad to be here. And so full disclosure, uh, UpChoose is an amazing partner of Lime Loop and uses the Lime Loop zippers to mill out their products. And so we'll talk more about that in the going in, but just wanted to kind of start that off with there. Um, but before we get into UpChoose, I'd love to learn more about you. So can you tell me a little bit about yourself and your background? Sure. So I, uh, I mean, where do I start? I grew up in Morocco. Uh, and then I, uh, you know, I uh, studied in uh, France and in the U.S. Um, and I, um, uh, yeah, I've always been, you know, very interested in uh, economics and social justice and development. Um, I sort of, well, when I was younger, I wanted to be a, a tennis uh, professional player. That didn't really work out. <laughs> Uh, but when I, yeah, when I started university, I, I was mostly focused on, uh, yeah, just like better understanding the world around us and, um, you know, always cared about, uh, I mean, now it sort of makes sense um, to describe it as the mix between, you know, business and ethics mm -hmm. uh, in a way. Uh, but yeah, I studied philosophy and I studied, you know, business, uh, you know, in parallel and I did that for a number of years and, you know, one thing leading to another, I ended up working, uh, you know, first in investment and, 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 and then in, in uh, what, I mean, I guess what you call, we can call like impact, uh, you know, entrepreneurship or. Amazing. Yeah, I love that. And not a firefighter, but a tennis player. That's, a, that's an amazing uh, <laughs> dream as a kid too. Dream growing up. Yeah. Awesome. So then how did uh, the idea of, of UpChoose come about and when did you get started on that? Uh, yeah, it depends when, you know, how you count and where you, you put the start date. Um, um, it really came in, in different layers, you know, it mm -hmm. certainly didn't come, um, you know, fully formed the way it is now thinking about, for example, you know, oh, there's a, you know, there's a gap in the market in terms of, uh, you know, baby clothing rental, for example, you know. Uh, it really started when I, you know, my previous job, I was, you know, I helped um, build and grow the sustainability investing team or impact investing team at JP Morgan. So I did that for, you know, almost six years. Uh, and yeah, I worked on so many projects related to, you know, all the big, you know, challenges, waste, climate, um, uh, you know, supply chain, including working conditions, uh, you know, chronic diseases. And, and essentially what we were doing is, is we would, um, you know, invest in projects or companies or, or sometimes create, you know, those projects and finance them mm -hmm. uh, around, um, you know, either, um, you know, providing access to essential goods and services. So for example, you know, invested in, in a lot of companies providing, uh, you know, education services or financial services, insurance services. You know, to the billions who don't have access to that. Um, but at the same time, working on a number of, you know, initiatives related to climate or nature mm -hmm. conservation. So, you know, we would, uh, for example, you know, we've created one of the first investment fund around uh, nature conservation, uh, or, you know, created the first, um, you know, venture capital fund actually dedicated to uh, Alzheimer and dementia, you know, research on the health, on the health front. So all that to say, I've spent many years working on this like big, big you know, ambitious, like mission driven projects. And um, there's, well, ultimately like the one thing that happened really over time sort of formed a view around, you know, a lot of these challenges have to do um, with our lifestyle, you mm -hmm. know, uh, especially in advanced, you know, economies. Uh, that lifestyle being very much, you know, driven by consumption. Uh, but in general, it, it's, uh, you know, when I try to resume everything down to a word is excess, you know, there's, there's too much excess, right, in, in, in the system. And so UpChoose is an attempt initially at thinking about this from the consumer perspective, you know, how do we, you know, empower people to better uh, approach, you know, how they, you know, choose things, buy things, use things, discard things. Um, and then as a company, it happens that we do it in a way that is, uh, contextualize, you know, like, okay, let's meet people where they are in their lives. Um, and so we starting at, at that, you know, beginning birth. 
I love that. And really focusing on where the behavior change needs to happen as opposed to at the end of it, kind of really going from, from the root. So, um, so for those who are unfamiliar, uh, what exactly is UpChoose? So it's, uh, I mean, I call it, you know, many names, but, uh, you know, sometimes I call it like a sustain sustainable consumption platform. But essentially what we do is we create services uh, for specific life moments. So in this case, you know, starting with birth mm -hmm. uh, that people can use to uh, just make the way they uh, buy and, you know, use and discard uh, the things they need uh, in a much more, you know, efficient and less wasteful way. Uh, now it's focused on uh, birth and children clothing. Uh, mm -hmm. So we've developed a, a service where people can, you know, subscribe and get uh, essentially, um, you know, all the essentials they need in one pack that gets, you know, delivered to their door. So we work with, um, you know, uh, premium uh, organic brands uh, that make the clothing. Uh, and then uh, that that's usually you know, way more expensive because it's organic, it's better for the baby skin, but, you know, we, we, that's part of, of, you know, the, like the, the market situation today is that, you know, the helpful and sustainable alternatives are usually uh, priced, uh, you know, very, very high. And so we create those, those, those sets um, for, you know, one size, say you receive your first set, you know, zero to three month size. Uh, and then the family would use that, the baby would, you know, use that until they outgrow it. And then they would receive their next, you know, set of, of, of the next size. And they'll send back the previous one that gets reused by, by the next family. So it's sort of a combination between, uh, you know, creation of like mm. all need in one place. Uh, so it's a very strong focus on just simplifying the whole process and, um, you know, reuse and circularity where many people can use or many families in this instance can use uh, things um, one after the other. And, and as, as a result, you know, products have a much longer life cycle, uh, you know, waste and clutter is, is significantly reduced and everyone pays uh, a much lower price. That's amazing. And I'm sure it's one of those things that people must hear and understand immediately, especially anyone dealing with yeah. baby clothes that you, they outgrow it before they even have a chance to wear it half the time. So I think that's an amazing, amazing concept. And I, I know that you kind of shifted the focus a little bit from more of a buyback program to a subscription model. So curious kind of how, what happened behind the scenes that um, directed you in that way? Sure, I mean, so as you said, it's, 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 it's funny because it's something that on the face of it is very straightforward, right? Like everyone gets that. It makes a lot of sense, baby grow really fast, especially if you, you know, if you, if you speak with new parents or experienced parents for that matter. Um, you know, it's, it, it makes a ton of sense. Uh, now, how you execute on that is more, you know, complicated. Like, it's really a case of everything is in, is in the details, um, you know, from uh, just how, you know, how you're going to operate such a, such a service, how are you going to make it, you know, how, how are you going to be able to organize the reuse part, uh, the, you know, the, the condition of, of, of the items, etc. cetera. Um, and so for the first sort of year and a half, uh, we operated, as you said, on a buy and sell back model, which is you purchase those sets uh, and then you use them for however long you need. And then when you need the next one, you purchase the next one uh, and then you send back the previous one and you get, you know, you get credits for that. Uh, and so that was basically a, a, a whole phase of learning um, wh where uh, essentially came down to two things, right? Like I needed to get uh, items back from people and then, and then to have them in, in good condition, you know, uh, so they can be reused uh, and to make sure that there is demand, you know, for, for, for secondhand. Like those were really the three things that we were sort of testing the hypothesis on that. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so we operated like this for like a year and a half. And then, you know, just like very interesting things happen. Like, you know, one is the demand for secondhand is, is, is huge, you know? So there's like really no question mark on, on that. Uh, and then what was interesting is like usually, um, you know, the, the, fa the, 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 the ability to get things back and to get that like uh, line of communication open with like new, you know, overwhelmed parents um, is the challenging part. And then the part where you get items back, like once you get them back, uh, uh, you know, to be able to have them in good condition, to be reused and, and, and be able as a company to, 
uh, take actions, you know, to uh, like support that, to improve that, to keep refining on that on that model. Uh, that that was a little, I would say, less challenging. You know, that, mm -hmm. that was not the main concern. Uh, like I could see how we could, you know, operate that. So the subscription came after when it was clear, based on our learning and data, that. Uh, you know, this is how we can make it work. This is how we can price it. Because the one important thing when you want to launch a subscription for this is you don't want it to be, you know, to create uh, added anxiety, right? Yeah. Like um, you don't want people to be, especially new parents, you don't want them to be worried about, you know, uh, paying like extra, you know, penalties if something happens to a piece of clothing mm -hmm. or, and so you want to combine you know, giving like a delightful experience and, and a, like a worry-free experience with a, you know, strong economic model, you know, it has to make sense. Yeah. Uh, and so that first year and a half operating on a buy and sell back model has basically been the, the laboratory for that. That's amazing. I, I think what people think immediately and happens with Lime Loop 2 is that draw with the milkman model. And I think it's just what people recognize and what people can draw on their map. Um, but I'm sure as someone who's behind the scenes, you recognize that that is just the tip of the iceberg. What's really happening behind the scenes to get you that milk every day and to get you those clothes every day is really where the actual uh, machine and, and the thought, the supply chain really comes in and is key uh, to success. Yeah, the other way I describe it is I probably wouldn't have been able or comfortable starting with a subscription model in the space from the get-go. You know, because it's very easy to start with this. Mm -hmm. But then what, if you look behind the scenes at, at, at you know, you want to you wanna have, like, we want to understand the economic model behind it and the operational model behind it. Uh, and so to me, it's only after having enough, you know, data and comfort around not only how to set it up, you know, on day one, but also how to make sure behind, you know, Behind that, there's a model that keeps learning, you know, that is going to, you know, enable us not only to be, in a, you know, at a good place when we start, but, but yeah. we just, okay, well, if, you, if we do that for a couple of years, you know, we'll be even at much better, you know, place um, there. So, so, so I, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, I wouldn't have, um, you know, been able to start with the subscription model. Yeah, and I think that's one of the challenges we're facing with the circular economy is a lot of people are talking about it in abstract and in theory, um, but you really do have to actually put it into practice, figure out, break things, and to the point that you're making, gather that data along the way, which is why technology, I think not only, similarly to you, not only could Line Loop have not existed without kind of that infrastructure, but without the access to technology that, that we have today to actually build and learn on that data, it would have been a very difficult thing to implement even as recently as five, 10 years ago. Yeah, and for me, you know, uh, we, we get put a lot in that bucket of like circular economy and, and um, well, what, what I usually say is, is you know, it, it's, it's um, that's not really the goal. Like circularity yeah. is not really the goal. It's a tool in the toolbox, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, that, that's what it is, at, at least for me or for, for, for us as Uptures, like it's not the end goal. You know, yeah. we, don't, we don't start this thinking, you know, we have to make things circular. That, like, I find it a little bit of, a, you know, academic uh, or academically attractive concept. Yeah, uh, I agree. You know, we're going to transition into a circular economy. I don't think that's the end goal. You know, at, at least for us as a company and our thesis, uh, the end goal is to... Um, you know, is to reduce excess and to create more intelligent services that, you know, in the first place, mm -hmm. you know, resolve uh, the situation uh, with more intelligent services, right? Like uh, the best way to solve a problem is to not create it in the first place. And, 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 and the circularity is really a tool in the toolbox that we use then, okay, how do we, you know, how do we extend the life cycle of the product or how do we make, uh, you know, reusability so that uh, people have access to the service at a fraction of the price. Yeah. Like we use that almost as, as, as a tool for, you know, to make the business model work. Uh, but, um, but I'm actually much more focused on, okay, how do we make it so that people early on upfront when they make their, you know, like purchasing decisions, um, you know, don't go crazy overboard and buy, you know, three times what they need. Mm -hmm. um, the more you reduce that excess, the less you actually have a need for, you know, circularity at, you know, at the end of the, uh, at the other end of the, of the spectrum. So, so yeah, I call it like a tool in the toolbox.
No, I think that's a really important part. And kind of on that topic of consumption that you mentioned earlier, um, what's the reception been like for that? Because it is, it is a behavior change, right? We were used to kind of getting things on demand, especially with COVID last year. I think even my parents who have never ordered groceries online now know how to do it. And, and just there's just things flowing and piling up at people's doorsteps. So what was the reception like initially? And has that shifted at all uh, with the onset of things like COVID and, and the growth of e-commerce? Uh, from from users, you mean, right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, well, it's funny because it is about uh, user behavior uh, uh, and it is not at the same time, mm -hmm. meaning that, um, you know, from like one thing you could say is like the hardest thing to do is to change people's behavior, right? And so there's like, we're trying to approach this in, in two ways. You know, number one is, um, and a lot of Uptrues is actually inspired by 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 uh, by the um, like user behavior or or science of behavioral you know decision making, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's why you you know one way of looking at you know us starting with birth or looking at life moments is like we're looking for catalysts, right? Mm -hmm. For moments in life where uh, you're already questioning the way you do things, right? So so so, and that's true for. Um, you know, behavior change in general, right? Like even for addictions or things like that, uh, it's much easier to, to, you know, to stop smoking when something, uh, you know, big happens in your life. Could be good or bad. It could be, you know, you, you're getting married or, you know, your best friend died of cancer or, you know, some like that's a catalyst. Um, and so, so the first thing about, you know, user behavior is, 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 is that we try to find those, those catalysts and then we try to take in on us to, to design a, a service that uh, has those, you know, desired outcomes embedded in it. Like it doesn't actually depend on you changing your behavior too much. And so here we, we're, you know, people are already buying online. Uh, you know, they're already passing on, you know, uh, pre-loved uh, children clothing, except it, it's done, you know, in their, you know, family circle. Uh, so in, in a way we are actually uh, embracing a lot of existing, you know, behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the reception, uh, the one thing is to buy everything at once. You know, that's the one thing that's a little bit like uh, novel uh, compared to how people do things usually, right? So mm -hmm. at the beginning, uh, the reception, to be honest, has always been very strong from the, from the get-go because for parents or new parents, it's, it's very obvious, you know, if you show up with something that really helps them, like concretely in their, you know, daily life and, and take something off their plates, uh, that will resonate, you know, uh, if you're not just trying to add to the pile or just, uh, so from the beginning, uh, it resonated pretty strongly. And then the, 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 you know, a little bit of the, of the, um, uh, like education has to be around, um, or the novelty is around, you know, buying thing all in one pack. And, and, and that is the thing also that has actually, um, has accelerated with COVID. So last year we had a combination of things, you know, in terms of how people react to it. Number one, obviously, is 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 COVID, and and so people are much more open to, you know, simplified solutions, which I think mm -hmm. is the is the biggest long term trend that you know that we have that we're pursuing. You know, it's it's not like it's actually to me stronger than reuse or secondhand or those things. You know, it's it's simplification. Uh, but democratized, you know, it's it's giving uh, those like super simple services. And it's funny because for us from the beginning, a lot of people look at us and say, hey, that's something for people in San Francisco and New York. And, you know, because people have equated uh, making things easier with something, you know, affluent and, yeah. and, and, um, and you know, for a certain, you know, type of lifestyle. Um, and so last year, um, there was an acceleration of the demand for, you know, instead of buying from like seven different places and having seven different shipments and all those things, you know, I can subscribe to UpChoose and have this whole need covered, you know, mm -hmm. at, at a click of a button. Um, and then the other thing was, you know, with, with the subscription, um, uh, we, uh, we're, we're seeing just a lot, lot more, you know, traction because it's a much you know, more straightforward offering. You just pay a monthly fee. Again, people are very much like getting used to those sort of things, you know, to apply like a, a subscription model to, to, to something that they need. So, uh, so yeah, so it's been, 
it's been great actually. Yeah, for sure. And as an outsider looking in, I can definitely see that that's translating to the community that you're able to build. Um, and so whether you're, I'm looking in from like the social media or some of the uh, really great feedback that you see about UpChoose. And I think one of the many things I love about UpChoose is that it's always looked like such and is such an authentic business, right? And I think especially in a day and age when so many brands are starting to Try to, trying to wear a diversity hat, trying to wear an inclusive hat. I think that you've had such an amazing way of making that an authentic part of who you are as a company from day one and yeah. it resonates and it shows. And so I would love to hear you talk about kind of how that came about, kind of what's your thought process and how you, you go about building a company that's so community focused. I mean, there's not, there is and there is not a lot of thought process behind it. And, and, yeah. and it comes back to what I said earlier where he didn't start thinking about, uh, oh, there's a gap, you know, no one is doing this for baby building. Started from a very, very different place. And then, you know, when I decided, well, let's focus on birth and children's clothing, um, you know, the first, the first step was to immerse myself into this world. I'm obviously not a mom, you know? So, and, and that's a funny thing here because people are so used to like, you know, if you start a startup, you should be the user, right? Like mm -hmm. you want something, you looked for it, you can find it, you ended up building it. And oh, like three of my friends love it. Maybe that's a company, you know, that that's the normal like story. And, and so for me, it was initially it was, well, you know, I'm going to do this and let's immerse myself into all the, you know, like the parenting, uh, you know, community, uh, you know, initially in the Bay Area or in San, San Francisco. And, uh, and so it, it sort of grows on you at some point, right? Like the first step of that is it sort of handles you and you become of service to that, you know, because you're, you know, it's clearly not something that you just can, you know, build on your own in your room with your computer. Uh, and so the, 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 that was, you know, really the, the first step. It was, okay, well, you know, I have to listen, you know, that's, that's really what I, I can do. Um, and then after that, um, it's really been about seeing how actually the, the service works, mm -hmm. you know? And so once you start getting things back and going back to the next family and things like that, you see everyone being extremely, first of all, as you said, like it's been, you know, way beyond my expectations in terms of how, you know, the feedback and then how people have been, you know, vocal and like, or, you know, very vocal ambassadors and all that. And, and you know, we, I, I do think what we do is, 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 is special, but I also know that we're doing it at, at one of the most special moments, you know, mm -hmm. in people's lives. So that's really, you know, getting amplified and all these things. Um, but once you see that working, you know, you like, at, at least for me personally, I, I saw that and I'm like, well, clearly this is a co-creation, you yeah. know, we come at it with everything from the company's perspective, right? Like we're here to organize things. Uh, we're here to talk about those issues and et cetera. Uh, but also, you know, our customers are making it work. You know, it's, it's it, and, and, and with COVID, you know, it, it resonated even like um, at, at a whole, you know, higher level in terms of understanding that our behaviors impact ourselves and impact you know, people next to us, right? Yeah. And and that's the kind of service that or model that Upchoose is building is like, well, if you take good care of the items, the way the family before you did, then, you know, the next family will enjoy the same benefits that, that uh, as you did. And as a result, everyone is, you know, saving money, saving time, saving clutter, et cetera, et cetera. And now when... I have a customer saying like, oh, like, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thanks to you. You know, we were able to have, you know, this at a fraction of the price, et cetera, et cetera. I'm like, well, you know, you're making it happen. Uh, yeah. And so that authenticity is coming from there, mm -hmm. you know, uh, partly is we don't have a choice, you know, because that's the service that we've built. That's who I am, et cetera. So I've had to get, you know, of service to that, uh, but also seeing how, it is actually a very, very collaborative, uh, you know, service. And, and that makes it to me like hundred times more powerful and interesting anyway. Uh, For sure. yeah. Totally agree. And I think what you're hitting the nail on the head on is that, you know, people want to have a conversation. Customers want to talk to the brands that they're working with. And I think a lot of times what happens is we silo and try to 
make feedback forms and kind of designated places and times in which you have conversations with consumers. But what I think what you've done so successfully is just kind of have somewhat of an open door policy. And, and when you do that and you invite people in, especially when you have a new concept like UpChoose is, is that it's really fascinating and interesting for people to want to talk about it and kind of have that open dialogue, which I think is so important, especially when you're talking about something that has such an important place in history in terms of the changes that you're trying to make, right? Why would you want to make that in a silo when you can build and, and change and make the new uh, version of it with everyone's input involved, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, switching gears a little bit. Uh, I know we you talked about kind of children clothes being that kind of great impetus and great initial place in, um, but the same way I like to tell people that Line Loop is not just a packaging company, up to it's not just a baby clothes provider. What is that kind of bigger vision? Where are we going in the future for up to uh, Yeah, I mean, look, there's, um, it actually ties very closely to what we're building today. You know, even just mm -hmm. the service itself, even if we only focus on children clothing and, and, and that's sometimes, you know, conversations that I have with like, uh, you know, investors or uh, different types of stakeholders. And so um, you could like look at what we do and okay, sure, like it's children clothing rental and, you know, to a large part, that's, that's what we do. Uh, now, when you look at the, the, you know, how our customers or members, you know, think mm -hmm. of us, uh, they don't think of us as a, as a baby clothing brand. Mm -hmm. And, and we are not a brand manufacturer. We don't make the clothes. We don't. And so they think of us as, you know, a partner in helping them, you know, organize their lives at, at the moment where they need it most, you know? And so, uh, you know, it could be anything from, you know, making, I, I, one of the biggest thing is like, you make my life so much easier. Yeah. You know, I don't have to worry about uh, like what I need, or I don't have to worry about, you know, the next size mm -hmm. and having to shop again or, uh, and so part of it is, you know, solving those, those, like just removing things off the plates at really moments where it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. You know, other things are around, like, you know, now I have more time and, and well, my time is like, and they grow up so fast, you know, so time is very precious. Uh, and that's part of our, you know, how we're building our brand as well. You know, it's, 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 you know, we always want to make sure you have amazing products and, 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 and experience, et cetera, but it's so much about also what it is not, you know, it's so much about, uh, okay, you've got the clothes covered now, you know, you're playing with your kids or you're doing other things, right? Like the things that are always going to be more, more essential in your life. Um, and so that is, to me, the, 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 the thing that I want to scale, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's not so much to say, well, you know, how, of course, like we're going to scale, you know, in, in, in our, you know, in our first like clothing, like in clothing and in, with our first audience, et cetera. Uh, but the, what we're really trying to build is that infrastructure, you know, and platform uh, where people can come to up choose and, uh, and have something sorted for them, you know, something they're trying to do in their lives. And so initially it starts with this. And then as you can imagine, we can apply a very like similar model to a lot of adjacent needs within, you know, within just this moment, you know? So at first we're thinking about things like, well, you know, when people receive their clothing, they, you know, the next thing you know is, or the next thing they want to do is to wash them. Right. Mm -hmm. and so guess who they're asking because they trust us around those decisions. So they ask, well, you know, what kind of, of you know, product should I use? And so, you know, there's different ways for us to grow into that. You know, we could, um, you know, include like other products within our service to, you know, to make the, the, the service like deeper, cover bigger, you know, uh, uh, part of the need. And then obviously you can grow in size and you can grow in, in adjacent, you know, things, uh, you know, from, uh, uh, maternity clothing to, um, you know, to children books, to toys, like there's a number of areas uh, where you can follow that thread uh, as long as, you know, it's part of that same discussion with, with our members, you know, and, and it's already the case. Like a lot of our members are like, you know, you've reduced decision fatigue so much. Uh, mm -hmm. for the clothes. I wish, you know, I wish you guys were doing it for, you know, my bedding products or, or, or all the toys I have at home or things like that. So, so there's a very like natural, like you have to find the right sequence, but this is a very natural, you know, full on um, 
or like roadmap around that. And then, and then obviously there's, there's the bigger vision around, um, uh, you know, around also just thinking about household consumption in general, you know, and, and, uh, and how, you know, what's the bigger, you know, vision around this, around other, you know, life moments, but not, gener not, not necessarily just life moments, but really contexts, you know, the, yeah. the ultimate goal of AppChoose is really to say, uh, you know, we've been serving products so far, you know, meaning we're, when I, like most websites, for example, e-commerce, in many cases, we're selling products. It's almost like we're trying to find a buyer for products and the customer mm -hmm. is product. And so what we're trying to do is say, well, let's look at what people are trying to do in their days, week, year, you know, someone is, is expecting a baby and then someone is, you know, owning, like buying a, owning a pet or someone is getting ready for a race or someone is, is moving to a new house. And so what are they trying to do from, from the perspective of, of their lives? And then, you know, can we create services that, you know, solve that with the same, you know, very similar principles, you know, ultimately it's like, how do you get the right amount or right quantity of something without all the waste? You know, how do you create for quality and for health or for sustainability? How do you, uh, you know, create like, um, you know, more efficient, like maybe, maybe reuse mechanisms, you know, so things are not just used for a short period of time. Uh, so that's sort of, you know, the bigger plan uh, to apply that to other contexts. I love that. It's almost like redefining what we say when we say minimalism. I think that's got in a certain connotation to it, but I feel like what yeah. you're describing is perfectly that, like, what do you need? When do you need it? And how do we repurpose it when, once you no longer do? And, yeah. and I love that full circle of because you have that kind of open door policy with your customers, your, your members, excuse me, you're able to have them dictate that as opposed to making wild assumptions about it. And, and, and what's interesting, I think is, and, and that's sort of my, you know, I navigate between those two things all the time, like the big vision and the very micro, you know, product design. And I try to make sure that when we're like, uh, you know, focusing on what we're doing right now, that's, that's already there. So to mm -hmm. give you an example, uh, in what we just discussed now in thinking about we're trying to to you know we're trying to to solve an outcome to get to an outcome rather than just to sell a product right and mm -hmm. the, the difference is you know people are not trying to buy baby clothes they're trying to dress their baby mm -hmm. right that's mm -hmm. and that can sound very trivial but to me that's very core that's at the core of what we do it's like uh well the goal isn't for you to buy clothing and isn't for us to sell clothing yeah. you know? and the way i think things are set up and that's, that's my view a little bit on e-commerce, you know, where, for example, this year, there's been so much talk on, you know, well, there's so much like growth in e-commerce and there's all these tools, et cetera. Uh, but that's still within the same paradigm from the last, you know, 300 years, you know, we're still operating as if we're just trying to sell as many products as possible and find them buyers. Mm -hmm. you know? And if you look at the way people have been describing consumption or, you know, like consumerism or things like that, you go back 50 years ago, it's exactly the same, yeah. you know? And so now, yeah, you can do it on a phone and you can do it quickly and you can do it with one click and it, like all these things, but it's still serving the same, you know, the same logic and the same philosophy behind it. Exactly. And for us, even for, even for that, we, and it's not something that's, that's very easy, you know, like, it's something is it's an interesting discussion we have with our members which is you're not paying for clothes you know you're paying for a service and 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 you don't go to up choose to buy clothing you go to up choose to uh you know have like to dress your baby to, or to have that you know sorted um and and yeah that makes actually a big difference for me oh yeah i think that consumption is so important Even when you think about last year taking that example you have this increase in e-commerce, but you also have this all-time high in waste production and donations being put out there. So we're we're just accumulating more things, but not that our need for these things increased yeah. because of the pandemic, just the yeah. whether it's the time or the ability or and a lot of other things to go into it. But yeah. it just doesn't make sense in the way that we're those things are rising relative to one another. And 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 that's something that's a, I mean, I'm it's a bit of a frustration for me because we focus a lot on like, you know focus a lot on my graph like you know the graph of like you know percentage of like you know online shopping in our e-commerce yeah uh, but then but then you know not many people are interested in 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 seeing the other graphs right like okay well returns you know how yeah. does 
and and you know you mentioned minimalism for me it's not so much about minimalism right you know it's i don't have a term for it right like it's 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 just being more precise and and mm -hmm. that's why i choose you know that's why I, I actually it's it's called up choose the vision behind this is, is an upgrade really yeah. in, in consumption in the sense that uh we're not even playing that game of like uh, you know buying less or uh or being minimalist like you don't have you know, not need all that. It, it's really think like switching the, the the logic and saying, well, okay, what are you trying to do? Uh, you're trying to dress a baby. Well, uh, if I give you a hundred bodysuits, you know, you're not going to use eighty of them. So mm -hmm. there's no point, you know. Like, um, and so it's more about trying to be more precise, you know, uh, and trying to understand what you know what actually solves that you know need. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, and without like, for example, for us, we don't, you know, it, it'd be completely ineffective to just, you know, be shipping things and swapping things, you know, item by item all the yeah. time, you know, it's partly like, you know, why and how we use, you know, Lime Loop and the mailers is like people receive maybe three or four shipments per year, receive it in the Lime Loop, you know, mailer, they get their new size, they put the old like previous size in it, they send it back and, and that's it, you know, they're done. Exactly. And no, I love that. And then so switching a little bit, I want to go back to kind of your past in um, on the financial side of things. You started out more on the social impact side. Now you decided that that wasn't crazy enough. So you had, you became a founder. And I'm curious, kind of having that dual perspective, yes. has that changed the way that you went into founding a company? And do you kind of look back at the way you might have been um, thinking about investing in companies and kind of think differently about that? How do those two things kind of tie together? I don't. I don't think anyone should do any investing before they start a company. I, I, I come to think now that it's it's completely absurd. It makes no sense at all. Um, the investing that I did before was very much structured finance mm -hmm. you know, and financial engineering. You know, like it was it was certain things around. It was not. It was not a lot of like early stage startups per se, you know, or or or, or like another way to say that it wasn't like a lot of companies that look like what I'm doing now, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and so part of it was, you know, to bring, uh, you know, large institutional investors and pension funds and like, you know, uh, investment funds uh, just to invest in, you know, impact investing or sustainability. So 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 that was that. Um, and then there were, you know, some of the projects we, we did were very like financial engineering, like for example, um, you know, some of the projects were, were around, for example, to, um, um, you know, create the actually, uh, like securitization of donations for vaccination programs. Yeah. So, so, and that was fascinating, but, but it was really about, uh, it was very finance you know, financial, like engineering oriented. Mm -hmm. um, and the funny thing uh, is that for a while before I left, you know, when I was still at my job before, like my initial idea was to, was to create a fund, uh, was to create some sort of like early stage fund that would, you know, work with entrepreneurs like me, uh, you know, mission driven and, 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 and to support them in that early stage because the, you know, the venture capital equivalent you know, four companies are pursuing, you know, large social or environmental missions. It isn't really there even now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I actually realized along the way that, you know, I realized, well, you know, initially I was like, well, I'm not a founder, you know, so I'm not an entrepreneur. So that's fine. That's who I am. I'm just going to work with people and support them. And then for a while it was like, oh, well, why do you want to, you know, help people do something instead of doing it yourself? You know, and so it took a while that, you know, I started like forming my, you know, view around, well, this thematic consumption is interesting. And, you know, it started really as a, as a intellectual exercise, you know, like, oh, everyone is so, so focused. Like I call it now the big toys, like everyone is focused on, you know, cars and rockets mm -hmm. and buildings. And that's great. You know, we have to transition in all these things, but they, they, they were much less, uh, you know, sort of bold, innovative thinking around culture and mindset and, and, yeah. and consumption, you know, like, great, we can change all this like hardware, you know, but the software in our minds is, is, 
you know, has to evolve as well. Um, and so now that I'm, you know, spent a bit of time, uh, you know, starting and building a company, it's, uh, yeah, I just see that's completely different. And if, mm-hmm. if, if um, what helps me a lot is to navigate between that high level, um, you know, thesis and vision and all that, but then you have to be very, very focused on, you know, the customer every day, refining the product, the design all the time. Uh, so that's, 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 that's a, a little bit different. Yeah, that, that focus, 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 I think is one of the, the big mantras for any yeah. founder. There's always opportunity. There's always different things you could chase down. But if you can't kind of have that vision both of today and 10 years from now, that, that's huge. Um, so kind of related to that, um, what has Obtuse's kind of find, uh, fundraising journeys been to date? Uh, well, the, the fundraising journey. So, so it's actually a bit related to your, you know, the, to the pre- previous question, right? Like, so when I... I started working on, on Upchoose, you know, while I was still at JP Morgan and sort of toying with the idea a little bit. And um, and so initially uh, I didn't like, it, it was just not my background, mm-hmm. you know, I was in London, I wasn't really trying to meet anyone with a deck or trying to convince anyone that I had a concept or anything like that, you know, I was literally, I had already started working on it, you know? Uh, so, so even without, like, it, it didn't even enter my mind, you know, to fundraise or to, um, and so I, I, I already started on this. And then once I gotten started, uh, and one, once the direction formed, I just felt it would be incredibly distracting, you know, to go and try to convince everyone, uh, you know, based on a deck or based on a discussion that they should give me. $50,000. Otherwise, you know, I wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it never really came to that. So for the first like year or so, uh, or like a couple of years, I, I just kept going, you know, I just built like the first version, didn't really think about fundraising. Uh, and then when it started to like, we started to have like customers and grow and all that. Um, then I started you know, trying to think, to talk to, 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 to people and meet investors and all that. And, um, and I felt at that time that, you know what, like we're generating revenues, we're growing and I'm learning a lot in terms of, um, you know, remember we talked about like the buy and sell back model and all this. Yeah. Stuff. So to me, it was very much about learning and then thinking about, you know, how this model would evolve. And, and so I just had the, 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 it was just like my, my drive was much more to build at the time. You know, I was like, look, um, uh, you know, it's too distracting to, you know, to fundraise. Uh, and so, you know, I'm just going to focus on, on building and, and I'm learning about these things r- rather than, you know, s- sometimes like uh, feeling like, uh, you know, I think if you, if you, if you fundraise too early, you can, you know, you, you might have, you know, a partner that's not really aligned with, yeah. with trying to do or 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 you know even worse like people have here's one thing that i found is people have very 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 strong opinions on how you should build your company mm-hmm. especially in silicon valley it's like okay well we know 95 percent of it so here's what you should do and to me i didn't come from that mindset you know i wasn't interested in building you know the render runway for babies or whatever mm-hmm. it is, right? um and I'm not saying that's not a good, you know, direction or, or anything, but I, I wasn't really interested. I, I wanted to explore and to think about things very differently and to give myself, you know, complete freedom to do that. And so I sort of put that on the side a bit and kept and kept building and just kept like growing revenues, et cetera. And so the, the nice thing is then when last year we transitioned into the, you know, the subscription model and, and, and a few other things um just things start, started to grow much faster and 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 so that opened up a lot of opportunities around mostly around like non-dilutive you know funding uh options you know so we started getting money from you know stripe and clear bank and you know now we were you know now we're raising well that's not non-dilutive but we're raising you know on on, on republic and so there's been a number of options we've had since last year uh, to uh, you know, to raise to raise money, and that's the kind of money that can help you to grow faster. You know, we still probably will you know 
uh, raised from institutional partners like the right partners to really focus on building the organization. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I would say like stage one was bootstrap purely then stage two was having, you know, access to a number of non, non dilutive funding options. Um, and so we're sort of at the end of the, that phase a little bit. I mean, we'll continue using that, but we're getting closer to the, you know, to the phase where, um, you know, we'll sort of go back and try to find like, you know, strong aligned, uh, partners. Amazing. Yeah. And I wanted to read a tweet that you wrote about your Republic journey. I think, I know we have some founders listening in. I think it's really important to keep in mind. So you said the goal is to fund the company in a way that is aligned with the mission and ambition. Now that we're raising on Republic, I get the question, why not BC, which makes no sense. It's not an either or, we'll do it all of the above. The more tools in the toolbox, the better. And I think that you perfectly sums up kind of that question that I get a lot too, like how do you go about fundraising? And, yeah. and it's just like, first of all, the question is why? And why are you fundraising? What is your mission? Do you even know what you're building, let alone what you want someone to join yeah. in and help you build? Um, and then you can start to have those questions. Okay, where can I look to to, to bring that in when the time makes, makes sense? And it's funny because I find that um, the way I look at this is, um, like we have to ask the first principle questions, right? And and back to uh, especially you know coming here in San Francisco in Silicon Valley, think, like you're starting a company. I, I feel like you know I came at a point where there was a lot of like people have been so successful, you know, in the past 10, 15 years, um, uh, that it sort of formed very strong opinions about again, as I said, like how you should start your company. Mm -hmm. You know, and the questions become, you know, are you a solo founder or are you a co-founder? You know, are you a marketplace or not? Uh, you know, are you trying to raise VC or not? And those are not first principle questions, you know. Um, and so the questions behind is really like, okay, well, you know, do you have a, a, like, do you have a, a support system? You know, are you alone or who are, you know, who's like uh, supporting you or, or who are you building it with or, or are you alone, you know? Uh, and it is like, okay, well, do you have, like, what's your ambition for this company? You know, like, do you, do you like, if you need like a huge amount of capital as you grow, where will that come from? You know, so those are all like slightly different questions. Uh, and so again, to me, and, you know, it ties back a little bit to my background in finance, but um, yeah, I think of it, especially now that there's a lot more options uh, and, you know, just given I have such a focus on the mission and the long, you know, the long term, like, I, it's something I would like to work for the next 20 or 30 years, you know, it's not something I'm trying to, you know, to build for a certain type of investor mm -hmm. or to build for, uh, you know, a certain type of company that could acquire us in two years. Uh, and so, so to me, that's why it's been very important to think a bit more, you know, to be a bit more, more pragmatic around this and say, okay, well, you know, What's in the what tools in the toolbox do we have? You know, can, yeah. what, what kind of resources can we get? Uh, but recognizing that you know at, at some point, yes, you get to a point where you know you um, you know you 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 need to know what your ambitions are. And and for us, for sure, like we have such an ambitious roadmap that we'll need um, you know we'll need to think about resourcing the company and you know and 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 like attracting the right talent, etc. Uh, whether that happens through you know, an aligned VC or, you know, some other, you know, ways uh, and a mix of, you know, how we generate, you know, revenues or how we operate or how we partner or, you know, that's, you know, that's to be seen. But, uh, uh, but yeah, at the moment, at least it's, it's a lot to me about, you know, what we're trying to achieve, what tools mm -hmm. we have, and then, you know, just trying to make the most out of it. And, and, and it seems like there's new in innovations in that space every month now. Yeah. There's a lot of different ways to, uh, you know, to to fund your business. So, um, so the like that basically also gave me license to take my time to like you know find the right partner. There's no, there's no rush in 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 you know, and, and I'm not pursuing any kind of you know signal or um, or you know trying to be absolutely like a certain type of company or like a VC backed company or all this thing. Right. That doesn't really make um, you know too much sense to me. Yeah, no, I think, and, and kind of the theme today is just like having those conversations, right? And just knowing kind of where your, what your goals are and both the micro and the macro sides of that and, and building towards, I think that's huge. Um, I could talk to you all day. 
<laughs> there's so many places that I want to dive in deeper and have more questions on. I, and I will definitely, if you, if you will have you back to talk about more things, but um, before we go, I, I know a lot of people are going to be really revved up and excited about the idea of up choose and what you're building. And it's really resonating with a lot of folks. So what are some ways um, if someone's sitting at home right now and wants to know how they can help to scale up, uh, up choose and be involved in what you're doing. I, I, so I want to tell you a little bit about Lime Loop. Right. Yeah. Like I, I want to say something a bit surprising about Lime Loop because so initially, you know, uh, uh, how that came to be is that, you know, with 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 Ashley, your your colleague, the founder, um, you know, we were together at, at, at the Levi's uh, mm -hmm. fellowship. And it's just, you know, uh, just like trying to find something we could do with packaging. Right. Yeah. And learning about cardboard boxes, et cetera. So so from the very beginning, actually, we started using, you know, Lime Loop mailers. Mm -hmm. So the, the interesting thing for, for, for me was, uh, you know, initially I was like, look, I, uh, you know, I just need something that works, right? Like I need those packages at work. Um, I need to make sure I know how to do this and having like a prepared return label and all these different things. And, you know, sure, like, uh, you know, the, the, the person at, at FedEx or USPS will <laughs> look at me a bit weirdly and all that. Like, but the interesting part was um, the reaction of customers. Yeah. You know, and customers from the beginning were thrilled, you know, mm -hmm. were delighted. And to me, that was a surprise because I, I, you know, I thought like, may, you know, maybe they won't really care too much about the packaging, you know, and, and, and they really loved it. And they loved the idea of not keeping a package, you know, mm -hmm. and it shows you something, which is, um, I think to, to me, what it showed me the most is that there's a tension. Yeah. You know, there's a tension and a pressure where, you know, around that excess and, and stuff. And people are, you know, uh, just like having so much, you know, boxes around the house. And, and so, you know, we're both at the very early days of our journey, right? Like things will improve a lot, hopefully, et cetera. But even with like the first version of, you know, of what we do, mm -hmm. uh, it gets that, you know, amplified response almost, you know, because a lot of people like, you know, are, you know, even like in terms of just like mental space, you know, it's like just, um, you know, they're just like, they're tired of having, you know, so much stuff around and having to keep and figure out all the time what you do with, you know, this extra package and this, um, and so, yeah, just want to say kudos to you and Thank I'm you. Very appreciative of, of, of this partnership. But I also know that, you know, for us as a company, we're very happy because, you know, we get to have a more holistic approach to sustainability, but it ties into the actual customer experience. Yeah, of course. Uh, um, yeah. So that's great. Sorry. Thank so yeah, to support. <laughs> I, yeah. I, I can't no problem, but, but on that, you know, I think it, it's huge. And I think what's really resonating to me about from this conversation, a lot of things, but especially what you said around, like you're not trying to buy clothes, you're trying to close, cl clothe your child. And I think that you can use that question and adapt it to basically anything in your life. And a similar thing happens with packaging. Why should something that gets a product to my house then last forever, then be a pile in the corner of my kitchen? Like it just these, these things, as you start to question these things and realize what doesn't make sense and what does and opportunities to make a change in that. And, and we always talk about the tipping point at Lime Loop when people get to the point where you realize like, oh, I, this is not the way it has to be. It's really hard to go back, right? How do you go back to having piles and piles of unused baby clothes after you've used a service like UpChoose? Yeah. How do you go back to having single use packaging after using Lime Loop and giving people those opportunities to have those tipping points, I think is really important about what we do. Absolutely, I agree, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so how do people get involved or what's the best way to reach yeah, out I mean, or, or get involved? It's, um, uh, upchoose.com, like you can learn about us. You can, we have a big focus on gifting as well, you know, so people can use, again, you know, we're focusing on birth, uh, which yeah. means, um, you know, like all the, the, all the things happening around that, right? Like obviously like babies and, and parents, but there's, you know, there's a big focus on, on gifting as well. Um, and so we have a lot of people gifting, you know, through Upchoose, which, which, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, like um, uh, it, it's also a way to really focus on reducing waste because there's so much, you know, the gifting side of, of, of this same problem is absurd. Like, you know, there's so much mm -hmm. waste that relates to that because you have to gift something. You don't know quite, you know, what to gift and, you know, things pile up and 
who might not even like what they receive, et cetera. So we're focusing a lot on, on gifting as a way to provide also like a solution there. Uh, and then we're also, uh, yeah, we're also currently opening up choose to anyone who wants to invest and be part of our journey. So uh, you can even find us on Republic. Uh, it's republic.co uh, slash up choose. Perfect. Uh, yeah, or you just Google, you know, Republic and up choose and you'll find us. Amazing. Well, Ali, a pleasure as always. So thank you so much for taking the time um, and really excited to continue to work with you uh, both on a line loose sense, but also just to continue to watch up to you grow and succeed and, and wish you nothing but the best. Thank you so much. Same to you and so much for having me.